What's up, everybody? Why is Neil upside down? What has happened in this in this thing? Okay, what do I fix first? The audio or Neil being upside down? I'm going with the... You don't don't touch me. Down. I'm going with the audio first because it's a podcast because, you know, that's what we do. It's uh, it's Agron Barracuda as per usual. Hello. Um, I remember something about... Uh, about Dave being tilted about something and wanting and i like flipped him or no he had a problem and i flipped him is it this nope is it we're gonna we're working his, on it his webcam came upside down i'm oh, actually okay. hanging from the roof oh. i'm in australia you know interesting oh. Welcome to Neil Ma. He's in Australia. You want to be, <laughs> you want to be Chuckle so bad, like uh-huh. Australian. It is embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Australian coach. There we go. Bang. Dude, I did it. Uh, Why'd you do that? Because you're not an Australian. We lied. You're actually way farther north. True. You're in the furthest reaches of Canada uh, currently. Wait, um, really? Yeah. Did Neil is well like be. Neil is oh. like way 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 out there he's like the middle of nowhere's middle of nowhere. out there? what i'm not in the middle of nowhere true. but i, I am don't know pretty north true. he's pretty north and pretty west Wait, it, yeah. is most of canada just nowhere <laughs> yeah honestly oh. yeah That's yeah like cool. toronto vancouver and then like what else do you do in your life if you're not in toronto vancouver yeah, i guess she's walking through nowhere you're, it's like an RPG yep. game. You're rooting for yep. the Edmonton Oilers. So that's what that's what you're doing. <laughs> you really are. Yep, that's kind of your only option. Oh, hey, I was supposed to say Wait. at the top of the show, but Neil was upside down. Uh, yes, today's episode is sponsored webcam. by Factor Meals. Head on over to factormeals.com. Oh my God, it's Bear's new dog. <laughs> oh. I will I will get every sponsor <laughs> in the so world mad at me to, sh- to shout out up to my nose while the he had, boy. Like, zoomies and he kind of ripped my nose ring. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh, my eyes are watering. Oh, you can't yeah. blame him. Look at him. Look he's him. Just so he's cute. so cute. Look at him go. He's so he's cute. adorable. <laughs> Little hammy, Bear's new puppy. Go look at Bear's Twitter. This dog is oh unbelievably cute. So bad. He's that actually is. coming down to Georgia games. right now. I know, I know. You've got to get here. <laughs> Neil's tearing up. Um, I really did shed a singular tear. I can see. Oh. Oh, look at the little, look at his little paws. This is really good. This is really good podcast content. Uh, Agro all and visual. Up. Okay. <laughs> If you're a l- long-time listener, maybe you found this podcast on Spotify, wait, wait, Apple like, Podcasts, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so cute. That's so oh cute. God. Oh, my God. My oh mind my just God. exploded. Maybe oh you've only God. heard us. You have no idea what either oh. of us look like. Uh, you've never watched a podcast episode. Go to the Prediction YouTube right now. Check out the VOD because you need to see Little Hammy. Uh, that is unbelievably cute bear is a new puppy um anyways yeah this episode is sponsored by hamlet uh but bear is a new puppy and by factor meals head on over to factormeals.com slash backliners 40 and use code backliners 40 to get 40 percent off your first box that's code backliners 40 at factormeals.com slash backliners 40 to get 40 percent off your first box also just pasted it in the chat there for everybody um Wait, oh yeah, I was going to tell another story. Uh, I got a story of what happened to me right before this podcast. It's something that could only happen to me, I swear. I Our usual meal on podcast nights, because we don't have a lot of time and because we need to, to order some Factor by going to factormeals.com mm-hmm. slash backliners40 and getting 40% off our first box. Uh, we're big frozen pizza on podcast night. You know, it's like nice and quick, nice and easy. I make sure to eat some vegetables for lunch sometimes. Sure. And then I have a frozen pizza for uh, for dinner on podcast nights. It's 20 minutes to podcast. I'm going to grab, uh, I've got a can of soda in the fridge that I want to grab. And as I'm grabbing it and pulling it out, it hits the corner of like the, the portion of the door that like, where we put like the milk, like the little like plastic thing. And it literally starts spraying out everywhere. Like I'm shotgunning this, like this soda. And it happened so fast. And like, I didn't hit it hard. It didn't make a noise. Just all of a sudden I'm just getting, it hits me directly in the face. That's the first place it connects is into my face. And I'm just like so stun locked by this soda and it's like spewing out. There's so much. And so I'm like, what? And then I like spin around. It's like all over my kitchen. It's all over my face. I just got out of the shower. So then I have to go up oh. and shower again. Cause you know, I'm getting real sticky. 
from uh-huh. soda being all and that's just uncomfortable. And that's just the worst. Is there a worse feeling than stickiness? Like stickiness has got to be the nah. It's bad. It's really bad. Stickiness it's up there is like with the like worst. when you touch change and then your hands smell like change. It's oh disgusting. yeah, like metal. Yeah. yeah. I like the smell of gasoline though. So after I pump, it's it's nice. Well, to that's get a little fine. Oh, I, get I that. used to. I used to like the, the smell of gas, but not not so much anymore. I don't know. My mature nostrils. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I outgrew it. So it's a juvenile. <laughs> you killed all those stupid brain cells. <laughs> yeah, that's probably actually what it is. So yeah, that's uh, that was that was what happened to me right before this. So um, I'm not oh, sticky uh, anymore. But oh um, good. Yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, yeah, we got Neil on the podcast. Neil is mm-hmm. now the coach of the Highland Ravens, um, and. Uh, I wanted to talk to uh, to you both about how it's been going so far for the season as a team and also to try and get Neil's perspective on coaching and his expectations of what being coach was like and what it's really been like. Um, but Barra, let's pretend Neil isn't Hello. here uh, for a oh, second. Oh, good. That's um, what I do most of the time anyway. <laughs> yeah, he actually lagged out. Uh, this is just a recording that I got stasis earlier mode. of him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's got, yeah, he's stasis moded um, just like usual. Uh How's it been having Neil as a coach and comparing him to previous coaches that you've had? Uh, really good. He cares a lot more than most coaches that I've had. Uh, he also gives a lot of input, which kind of makes me feel bad for the amount of times that uh, I troll or do stupid things in scrims. I'm just thinking, man, Neil's watching this and knowing <laughs> he knows that I shouldn't be doing this. And he knows that I know that I should be doing this and I'm still doing it. So I kind of feel bad for him sometimes, because there's there's just some days where I just can't, you know? Like it, maybe today, it, potentially? It, uh, no, I was giving it my all today. Uh, I was really, really? Uh, cranking up. Yeah, uh, I definitely didn't die ten times in one scrim. Or nine, <laughs> nine times, nine times. Yeah, it was it was nine times. Uh-huh. Uh, I was really uh, turning up the gas today. Uh, there, well... It was, look, it's my first day alone with Hammy. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a lot on my mind. Uh, the the tree pollen is just crazy right really now. Really high. Yep, my allergies it, are acting up. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a nice workout this morning. My arms were tired, and I came mm. into scrims. And, you know, I was really giving it my all today. Mm. And uh, Neil just ripped me a new one today. I just couldn't. Really? He, yeah, I don't he know about that. He, he screamed at you. He said, well. "Get your get your act together. You're off this team, John." He said those exact words, or am I yeah. like paraphrasing? Well, he he basically said it. Basically well, what said I said it. was, "Hey guys, I know this is a practice, and this is like the most <laughs> extreme example of this, but this happened on game day, but in a much less severe way." And then we watched it, and we're like, "Yeah, time, <laughs> that would just never that should never happen." But like, why not? <laughs> Was it you know, uh, was it Barra maybe doing a little a uh, little tanking for the team yeah, potentially? He he just he just wants to be Tyler Herwin really bad. Mm. Yeah, and he's just like maybe I get in there first, <laughs> and mm. I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you think it's yeah. good? I was he's not a- the safest gamer today. Uh huh. Mo- all every scrim. I- Look, <laughs> our first scrim lasted sixty minutes. You can't expect mm-hmm. me. To, to be chalked. at my best after that. Nope. Yeah. The whole day is chalked. Instantly. Exactly. Yeah. Can't can't be asking for that. I don't even remember if we won that game. Uh, <laughs> it just... Even if we won, it doesn't matter. You had a 60-minute scrim. Neil, did you, do you know if you guys won that scrim? I can't remember. They all mm. flow together. Yep. Wow. They really did uh, destroy the mental then, huh? That's kind of how it <laughs> It was a painful day. Painful I think my game scrim. crashed, and like after... If you're like less than 10... If you're past 10 minutes in the game, your game crashes, you'll never catch up again. Mm, and so I'm just mm. watching like a Discord stream, and they're like, "What happened in this fight?" I'm like, "I, I don't know. know." Like I kind of <laughs> watch from like Scream's perspective, and he's like running around. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like what the jungler is supposed to do, right? Just yeah, run just around, do his thing, yeah, do your yeah. thing. Yeah. How's uh, really a how? What were your what were your expectations of what coaching were going to be like, Neil? And how has coaching uh, defied or met those expectations? Uh, well, I know when I started coaching. I just thought that I'd be able to, like, have a strong voice and help bring some change and help, like, create structure for a team. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think with this team, they, they have, like, a lot of the ideas of the structure in place. It's a lot about, like, reminding them, especially now. Like, at the beginning when I first came in, 
I felt like it was more like we were building some good fundamentals and stuff, but now uh, everyone learned really, really fast, and it's kind of just about trying to make sure that we improve on those. It's really hard to come in every day and like just nail it down, nail it down. It's a lot of like broken record stuff, but in my opinion, that's a lot of like what helps you on game day, especially at tournaments, is just if it's been nailed in enough that it'll be automatic. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of repetition, things like that. And it is kind of hard to improve small things at a time, but I felt like coaching has been really rewarding that way. And I've been really impressed with everybody's ability to like retain information and improve and learn, especially Hurry since he hasn't played support that long. And he's like really, really impressed me. He's been really tremendous. Everyone has like a really good voice on the team. But uh, overall, yeah, I think that coaching has been pleasantly surprising to me. Everyone's been really receptive and everyone has been um, really vocal about what they want from me and everyone's been really happy with my work, which has been really rewarding in that way. Just mm -hmm. feeling like I'm coming in and helping them improve in any way at all has just been it's been good so far. And every, the team has been playing really amazing so far, so yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, I think uh, obviously you guys have come out of the gates looking really, really strong and I'm glad you mentioned Hurry because, I mean, obviously had like one of the sickest Yamoja alts. Um, <laughs> yeah. We've seen in competitive play this week. Uh, he's looked really good. How, how have you like spent extra time talking with him about just like support mentality or ways that you would play situations and that kind of stuff? Or uh, has it been kind of the same as uh, working with everybody else? I think at the beginning, I spent a little bit more time with that. And I think in general, I still do just because it's the role I'm most familiar with. Like honestly, the person I give the least of that kind of stuff too, in terms of like the general game plays Haddix, just because I feel like Solane is so unique and particular in that way where I'm not going to know the matchups like he does. I'm not going to know X or Y mm -hmm. and team fights and whatnot. Maybe I'll have more input, but I feel like for a lot of like the general micro plays, I, I can talk to Hurry about it and he's really receptive, but for the most part, he doesn't need that much instruction. Like sometimes I'll, I'll go back to something and be like, Hey, like, I think, what do you think about playing it like slower and playing it this way or holding your ability for this? And most of the time, he's like, yeah, I was thinking about that. I just knew that was like a mistake when I did it. Mm -hmm. So I think that he's got really good instincts. And I also understand that me and him are different players as well. Like some suggestions I give to him. Uh, I know that, one, I'm not infallible. So someone suggested I give to him. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll think about that. But I don't really press him to do anything he doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Because like when I played, I wasn't a perfect player either, right? I had my own style. I was good at some things, worse at others. So... I think it's good that he just kind of takes the input and then uh, processes it and uses it as he sees. But he's definitely the player I would say I still give the most. I have the most under a microscope just because it's, I think, the one that I have the most ability to help give perspective on. Mm -hmm. I think that I can give help and I do give help to other people as well. But uh, I just think that it's harder for me to give ADC advice to someone like Bear in terms of like a micro thing. As not today to telling <laughs> well sometimes you make it really easy for me but I, I think my specialty comes from like just just map play and macro play and then talking about how the team should be setting things up and trying to help them give direction to that mm -hmm. and i think that's general for everybody mostly but then yeah i can go a bit more specifically with tyler sometimes yeah, yeah i think you're just really good at I mean, you touched on it, but just nailing in the fundamentals and kind of bring us back to a base of what we should be focusing on, whether it's like a scrim set or whether it's like this week or like if another team is doing something that we should be doing. Um, I think you do a good job of like kind of enforcing us to not show up to scrims and be like, okay, what are we picking today? What are we playing today? Like there's a normally like a guideline of what we should be playing. Um, but also like everyone on the team is already doing that, but Neil is like kind of the, the final hammer. Mm -hmm. the the ha the head honcho hammer mm -hmm. if you will um yeah. he's also nice about <laughs> calling us stupid or like he's very what do you very mean? kind in his words <laughs> <laughs> really is but he he goes about things in a nice way to where you don't feel like stupid about it mm -hmm. um which is very very nice you don't feel like you're like arguing with someone it's more of a conversation than a, a debate i guess yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, Bear, uh, uh, Neil, I'll also ask you this, but uh, I've been wondering about the team dynamic for the Ravens because so often in Smite's history, I would say the vast majority of teams fall into the stereotype of one to two very talkative players and then two to three uh, 
or maybe one to zero to like medium talkers and then one or two players who say next to nothing um, and just focus on hitting their stuff. And that has kind of gradually become less and less true throughout the years that people have mm-hmm. become more and more ingrained in the game and understand that communication is a big part of it. But I feel like this Ravens team is one that I look at as all five of you are known to be pretty good communicators uh, in your roles um, and have pretty strong voices about what you want to do in game. Um, Do you think that this team has been different in that regard than other teams? Uh, And how difficult was it to like find who was doing the majority of the, you know, shot calling in the early game versus the mid game versus the late game and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think we're still kind of working on this. Uh, game days especially, because uh, everyone obviously talks more on game days and takes it more seriously. Right. Which sometimes leads to issues of too many people talking, too many plans going on. And then we're too busy talking, making a plan where we're not doing anything on the map for like 15 to 30 seconds because we're all like discussing like what our next play should be. Mm-hmm. Um, but Which I think is something which will be ironed out. But... Uh, to your point, I've never been on a team with this many people that communicate at the same time. Right. Um, it's team fights were really hard for me in the beginning. Like I was saying literally nothing in the beginning. Like mm-hmm. once we joined as a team, like I couldn't get a word in in team fights. Mm-hmm. And it was also really confusing for me because I'm normally pretty talkative in team fights um, to say like next to nothing. So I think we're still kind of cranking each of our knobs for communicating at different points of the game, trying to figure out like. Um, in the late game, who wants to be not the main shot caller? I don't think we'll ever have a main shot caller, but the voice that everyone listens to, um, and also like figuring out like what we're doing in the team fights and like what page, whose page we're on, basically for each team fight and each objective. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I, I think that is something we need to like speed up sometimes because we'll be kind of slow to like mm-hmm. make our play. Um, which I think we are getting better at, and I'm definitely getting more used to Scream and Hurry than I was at the beginning. The beginning, I was pretty rough communicating with them. Um, just I didn't really know how they worked in a team fight and what kind of what plays and what style they would go for in like early early game, mid game, late game. Just adjusting to two different rotators is was pretty hard for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm definitely getting more used to it. But I think that's our biggest issue right now is just kind of quickening our plays right now um which i'm not really worried about it it's just i think that's like our major issue sure yeah neil how does this team uh communication wise compare to other teams that you've been a part of yeah this team definitely everyone is like talking if anything on most teams i've played on the the problem is not everyone's talking it's like one or two voices on this team uh especially in spl sometimes it's like everyone's talking it's hard to even know what we're supposed to be doing period because everyone's saying different stuff. But uh, I think we're doing a good job of, of trying to stay on top of it. And we have conversations somewhat consistently about comms and how we should be setting up fights and getting everyone on the same page has kind of been the biggest thing we've been working on is just understanding, okay, what is like what are we going to be doing and how are we going to do it? Mm-hmm. And what is everyone's role in doing that? And it's a lot of moving pieces in the game and it's hard to set up, but I think... Uh, as time goes on, we'll just get more used to each other, and I think that we've been doing a good job of progressing forward in that way. Because mm-hmm. it is a really complex thing, and every single game is going to be different, right? Like, if you're playing a really tight five, five-man five team comp, and you're playing off your carries, it's going to be different people directing. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're diving really hard, it's going to be a whole different set of people kind of directing what's happening. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's kind of just like a, a thing that each game is going to look different, and we're working on it. But I think that we're having a good understanding of how to go about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's a good thing that everyone has so many good ideas. It's just going to be about narrowing down to who should be talking and when and, and how much, right? But mm-hmm. it has been very different from other teams just because we have so many people who have strong opinions about the game and who are also talkative. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's an aspect of the game that gets talked about a, a little bit, but certainly not as much as it doesn't get talked about proportionally to how important it is to a team success on like how they communicate as a team. You know, there are players who we talk about as shot callers and all that kind of stuff, but 
I don't know, like, I think everyone who hasn't played competitively probably imagines a shot caller being, like, the Pain Divion. Pain Divion. The, the yeah. Elion, you know, the, like, the StarCraft mastermind that's uh, yeah. puppeteering the entire team. And in reality, that just isn't how it works. Uh, I don't know any team that operates in that way. Um, it is, uh, you know, you'll have someone who handles talking about you know how the how they want to start a fight and someone who's talking about who their you know who the target priority should be and then someone else is bringing up okay if we win a fight we're gonna go we're gonna move straight to gold or straight to fire or like we're all gonna back here like everyone kind of assumes these little roles and there are a lot it is way more than you think of those like little things that someone has to be keeping track of. And especially when you don't have that puppet master that doesn't exist anymore. It means that everyone has got to do their own little piece of that puzzle. And making that puzzle like smooth is uh, difficult. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's just so many, so many moving pieces. But uh, that was some of the most fun. I, mi- I miss the days where uh, teams didn't. This could be taken weirdly out of context. I miss the days where te- a lot of teams didn't have coaches because I could go into the into the coaching booth and listen to their comms during the games because there wasn't a coach there to listen to the comms. And that was some of my favorite smite I've ever watched is getting a chance to just sit in a, in a real live SPL match and listen to comms and uh, figure out, you know, who's, who's contributing what to, like, the team environment, um, I think is really interesting stuff um Mm -hmm. that you know there's been some content released kind of along those lines but with strategies and all that kind of stuff it's kind of hard to um to make that content consistently yeah i would love like a funny moments montage of like voice recordings from spl matches Mm because yes our team says a lot of stupid things and you can make a whole montage out of just us yeah we definitely talked about doing that many times while i was in esports there were just a lot of issues with like someone has to go back and watch all of that footage to like find those moments. And there were, there was a time where admins, because they're in comms, like in the boost with the players, obviously. So they would like, if they heard something funny, they would like market the time in game so that the production team could go back and like pull it. But then it's like, it needs this whole approval process from the mm. team that it can be released. And it's just like so many hoops to jump through for like, fairly short content that Mm -hmm. um i don't know if they're still planning on doing things like that but uh it is it is really good stuff one of the funniest moments of my life potentially was listening in on some on the comms of some like all-star event uh where meerkat it was like meerkat god who was on that team meerk would probably remember i think it was meerkat baskin uh how long ago was this? It was so long ago. It was like a, it was a SC, it was an SCL LAN, like it was a console LAN and a PC LAN. God, oh, who else is on that days. team? There was some, there was someone with some really good dry humor on that team. There's a tweet thread on my Twitter somewhere. Cause I was just tweeting out like quotes. I think it was Cherio was on that team. Maybe. I don't know. Meerkat got soloed by just lion, a PS4 player in ADC like <laughs> twice. And Obviously, everyone is just ragging out of it. At one, <laughs> Meerkat is about to get soloed, and he's just going, "Oh my god, I'm getting PS4 would on!" Like he was just <laughs> extremely Meerkat voice. Uh, it was absolutely awesome. Someone should go and find that thread. Uh, it is just a gold mine. Um, just so funny. Uh, anyways, um, Neil, I also wanted to ask you about. Uh, you didn't start the season um, on the Highland Ravens. You were the coach for. Uh, Sam for soccer's team as they tried to qualify to the SPL. Um, Take me through that uh, event a little bit as a coach and then kind of like how you ended up on the Ravens after that. But I'm curious on that event from, uh, from your perspective. Yeah, those events are always, well, the most stressful for everybody and also the weirdest because you're kind of like the guinea pigs of the new season. Yep. But it's also like literally the biggest tournament of the year. Even like for those players, it's bigger than winning worlds in terms of money. Yep. Or like financial security. Yep. And so there's like a lot of stress around it. There's a lot of like new variables that people don't know. No metas have really been fleshed out. You're not really practicing against many of the teams in the tournament. So it's weird. 
And I think that uh, we had a really good team. I think that we had a bit of trouble kind of pulling it together. I think that we like, put ourselves in really good spots to win the tournament. But I think there's like a lot of curveballs and weird stuff that happens like in terms of like the meta picks and your grasp on the meta versus other people's for like such a short period of time can make it strange. Mm. But I think that we had our chances and we had good shots and they're all really good players, but just kind of... I, th I think it was just a, a lot of pressure and then just kind of a few key moments went wrong and sometimes that's just how tournaments like those go, right? And I think mm -hmm. that, not to say other teams don't deserve it, obviously the result is the result, but it was obviously a bit uh, disappointing for everybody. And watching when you coach at those tournaments is like so much more stressful than playing because when you're a player, mm -hmm. you're like just in the moment and it's just like you're not focusing on like the result or anything. You're just kind of taking it play by play. Mm -hmm. And when you're coaching, you have no control at all. And you're yep. removed from the situation. You're just watching it, everything happen. You can see everything, like, as things are about to go terribly wrong, someone's like, we should do this. And you're like, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. And then, like, oh, man. But it's it's just crazy to watch. But, yeah, obviously, didn't end up qualifying, which was heartbreaking for everybody. All those guys were amazing. And then um, I basically just didn't really have a spot as a coach, which was a bit disheartening for me because... From my own perspective, I felt like I could bring a lot of value to a team, specifically because I've just been like a, a relatively successful player and played a lot around a lot of players who had good opinions about the games and seen a lot. And I thought I could bring a lot to uh, any team I played on, really, or coach rather. And then, um, for whatever reason, Mask didn't want to coach this year, and the Ravens just said, "Hey, like, like you, we we basically just think that you're the next guy up. You wanna you wanna have a chance at it." And I obviously jumped on it. I thought it was like a really good group of guys to work with. Mm -hmm. Good attitudes. And I didn't really know how it was going to be, but everyone was really receptive. And so it's a really easy environment to work with. The guys are pretty good at understanding uh, what is going wrong a lot of the time too, which which sometimes can make my job a bit hard because a lot of times a lot of the input I'm going to sell them after games, like even during SPL, a lot of it they, they recognize like, we messed this up and like this is a problem. We should change this. And I was like, Literally looking at what I've written down, I'm like, yep, that's, that's what I wrote down too. Like, yeah. you, got, you got it. Like, it's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that it's it's just been great working there in so far. Everyone gets along well, so it's a good team dynamic for sure. Yeah, I can uh, I can agree with from a different perspective. Um, thinking about those exact same games because you know I as I've talked about on this podcast, Sam for soccer is one of my best friends and uh, was really rooting for him to qualify and. If I were casting those games, even knowing that I want Sam to qualify, whatever it is, uh, I would not have been a single ounce stressed while I was casting because I would have just been focused mm -hmm. on casting um, and doing my job properly and, and all that kind of stuff. And then afterwards, I would have been like, oh, wait, like that sucks. Like it's kind of it, it's kind of like this detachment where you're just so focused on executing that you don't the the moment doesn't really like hit you at all um i mean i could say the same for casting like in the finals um my first year i mean every every single year i got really nervous right before the finals uh and then as soon as it would come to us uh i wouldn't even register that we were like casting a final mm -hmm. um you know i would just be uh do it you, you don't even think about it it's just like you're just doing it again what something that you've done a hundred thousand times uh but watching those games like as a spectator who cared about the outcome for the first time and literally that was like the first set as a spectator that i really cared about who won in since season two uh yeah that like that long which is crazy to think about you know it was that's what for me felt like watching cherry at worlds the last two times like yeah. i was stressed out during cherry sets and then watching sam set like equally stressed me out mm -hmm. just knowing that how good he is and how good everyone on that team is mm -hmm. and just watch them like constantly underperform on like either teamwork or individual plays like dude that set stress i think i legit got like anxiety from that <laughs> like oh, that's it stressed me out so, like if i was playing i would never be stressed or never nope. be like anxious i would be like semi-excited or like nervous but i'm always that way when i play mm -hmm. but 
it would never reach that level of stress or anxiousness. Like, nope. It is so much easier to be in the game than it is to watch the game. Yep, for sure. Not even close. Hey, uh, Barra, who was the one who you were stressed uh, when Cherry was playing in those final sets and... You know, they were up a lot of games, and all of a sudden, they just, like, start losing. Like, who was... Mm -hmm. Do you remember who was doing that to him? Uh, I'm having a tough time remembering. Neil, yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, I don't know... I don't think it was either me or you, Agro. No, we definitely wasn't games. me. I, I was casting some of those. Yeah, you were casting. Uh, I don't think I was playing. <laughs> Neil? Neil, I had thoughts? to do it to him. It's him or me, man. It's him or me. I mean, they had their chance. I mean, that's on them. That's not on me. That's on them. Hey. That was a heartbreaking set, dude. Both Tough. of those sets. I disagree. Goodness. I thought it was pretty cool. Hey, to each their own. Uh, to each their own. Um, I mean, how can you hate the whiplash play that Agro called? Yeah. The whiplash how play. How can you hate it? I don't yeah. even remember that play, to be honest. What was it? One... Okay, we went to gank vote, and then while we did that, we did pyro. Uh -huh. And then when they went to rotate, after pyro, they pulled fire. Uh -huh. And we got fire, and they were running back to fire. We got the fire, and then when they were... We got the fire and got out, we did gold at the same time. Man, you were, you gave him whiplash. That's, That's what you said. That's yeah. a great call from me. It huh? was a great call. We can pull it up right now. <laughs> watch it at the end if you want. I kind of do. Goodness. Yeah, I kind of do. That okay, sounds, I'll that find it. Like and we'll, I'll, I'll link it. I'll remind us. Yes, excellent. I've got. A, I, I had a moment that I wanted to watch with you, but that's for after stream. So it's uh, we, now we've got a little Ooh, little excited. vod review coming <laughs> yeah. right after this. this. We're walking into Neil's territory now with uh, with vod review. That's like his thing oh. now. It's He's yeah, pulling you me. in aggro. Yeah, yeah. I love the vod it. review. <laughs> no, I listen. If I were not uh, employed uh, by High Res Studios, I've said for a long time that I think coaching would be a ton of fun. Um, mm -hmm. I love working with like a small group to, you know, m get better and improve and um, focus hyper focus on little things. Like I think all of that is really fun. Uh, and mm -hmm. if I were allowed to coach, I would definitely try to do so. Um, but yeah. obviously, I can't, it's, so uh, I won't. It's interesting because it's. It's tough for, like, different reasons, too. Like, it's hard to... You can't talk about too much at once, right? Because a lot of coaching I've learned as well, it's pretty obvious when you think about it, but it's, like, how do you teach people effectively? Yeah. And, like, I remember with with, with the team, like, uh, the Wargs, and I was coaching them, uh, I remember I was... We were, like, working on some fundamentals, and after we worked on some fundamentals, we were trying to get a bit more specific. Mm -hmm. and at, they hadn't like finished like figuring out like their system their structure of the team and as we were trying to introduce more things and by the end of it people were just like i'm just so like burnt out and confused and there's so much information i'm trying to remember like it's too much right and so it's kind of difficult to juggle this balance of like how much time do you want to spend on one thing and then try and be adding new things mm -hmm. without having discarded the old things and without overwhelming people so they can't remember anything right Yep. So it's interesting to just think about this like this balance of here's the information I want to tell them, but I can't always tell them everything, and we can't go through everything for sake of time and yep. for other factors. Like I said, for just for trying to learn too much at once is just is detrimental to itself in a way too. So yep. mm -hmm. it's definitely that's one of the things too I've noticed is kind of um, a hurdle with coaching that I didn't really expect, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I remembered what the my final coaching question that I had for you before we move on to talking about bonus balance. Um, throughout the years, you know, I've done a lot of interviews with coaches. Check out all the old round coaches roundtables and that kind of stuff. It's all still very good content. Um, and I think that a lot of coaches in Smite have told me, um, you know, Biggie comes to mind. Uh, Chuckles um, has talked about this a good amount. Good old Chuck. Uh, the the fact that what they do isn't as much of in game you know working on giving players advice on in game stuff at times you know there's a little bit of that uh, there's a little bit of like picks and bands work and all that kind of stuff but a lot of it is just like teaching the team how to work as a team and helping individuals as individuals and and ha teaching them how to work in a group and that kind of stuff. And being more like um, less about smite coaches and more about like personal coaches on how to interact in a team environment. Have you found that you've done more like just from what you know you remember other coaches that you've 
worked with doing? Like, do you think that you've also done a lot of that so far? Or have you been mostly doing the the in-game stuff more than um, what a lot of coaches have described up until this point? I think, from my perspective at least, I feel like I've been doing more in-game stuff about, like, especially since I came from the preseason tournament with the Wargs and everything, being able to watch it from a coach's perspective, I think, well, firstly, has actually taught me a lot about the game. Mm-hmm. Seeing it from that perspective, I feel like just gives you another angle. And when you're playing, you see the map much more narrowly. So I think when we first came over, I had a lot of experience already with how I felt we should be playing the map for the war. So I thought I had a lot of impact there. But also generally, I just feel like this team doesn't need a whole lot of navigating personality wise. Everyone gets along really well and clicks really well. And I think one area we struggle with interpersonally is sometimes we'll be saying the same things and we'll kind of not realize we're saying the same things and we'll be agreeing about things and be talking <laughs> yeah. about it for like 20 minutes. So that's like the one thing I think interpersonally where it's like, okay, like I think we're saying, this guy's saying the same thing as you mm-hmm. in general, sometimes specific, we don't agree. But for the most part, I think I've been more of like um, like an in-game like smite coach being like, I think that we, when you make this rotation, it's really bad for this reason. It might have worked out in this scenario, but I think in general, it's kind of bad. Or I think that like when we're setting up for like this objective, we should be doing it this way and be looking at it from this kind of perspective. Mm-hmm. Or being like, we are doing this like really badly and something we need to improve on. From my perspective, and so I feel like I've been impacting the team more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just because I've had a lot of playing experience that kind of has allowed me to give that kind of view. Because a bit of a rant here, but I feel like when you look at like traditional sports, you see a lot of like really old coaches. Like everyone's quite elderly typically because they've been around the game for like 50 years. Mm-hmm. And so when you have this 20 year old come to the league, it's like, this dude is like four times your age and knows way more than you because they've been around the game. Mm-hmm. But with something like Smite, it's only been out a decade and the coaches and the players have been playing the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times the players will just know more than the coaches just inherently, mm-hmm. right? When you right. play at that top level, that's the best experience you can get and you have the best understanding of the game. Mm-hmm. So esports is really interesting in that way. So I think having the experience of being a player kind of enables you to have more ability to help with in-game stuff. Mm-hmm. But... It's not like I'm some mastermind here telling them exactly what to do, right? It's a lot of give and take, and I give my opinions, but I think that a lot of what I've been doing has been more so in-game than interpersonal. Mm-hmm. No, I think that makes yeah, sense. I would definitely, definitely agree with Neil as well uh, for the in-game stuff. Um, I don't think our team really needs the, him to like facilitate conversations or facilitate people's ideas because mm-hmm. um, people are pretty stubborn sometimes on this team so he kind of lets us hash it out versus like because no one is really getting like angry with each other people will be like stern with each other but never like straight up yelling or angry or anything um but that's just like people need to get their emotions out so he doesn't stop us from getting our emotions out and i think that's a healthy thing Mm -hmm. Um, because if you're like if I'm mad at Hurry for doing something he just lets me like talk to Hurry for a little bit and then we work through it or me or whoever else Um, and I think that's the healthiest way to do it because sometimes it's like if he interrupts then the player will feel like they didn't get their full opinion out Mm -hmm. um, or still feel like a slight disagreement with that person Um, but yeah I don't think our team really needs that we just need more of the in-game stuff yeah yeah i think that makes sense um all right two more quick questions before we move on to bonus balance i know this is the last one but i lied um a uh, question from chat here only kakarot wanted to know if it's harder to coach or to play for you neil i think it's just way hard to play because like as a coach you have impact but like once the like once they're in the booth and they're playing i mean you could have like a perfect draft and they could lose or you could have like a really bad draft and like they could just stomp them right I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to the players. The coaches can be really a helpful tool for the players. But, I mean, for some teams, like, they probably don't have... For some teams, their coach probably doesn't do a ton of in-game stuff for them, but they could still be really successful, right? So, Mm -hmm. from my perspective, I think that playing is always going to be harder because the onus is on you. Mm -hmm. Although, that being said, sometimes people just can't... Just can't agree if a coach does, like, everything or nothing. Sure. Like, I remember after we, like... After the tournament, people were just like, wow like uh such a coach diff like like they, their drafts were so bad and i was like where's this 
Isn't it usually people are just like flaming the players? Like, what is happening? Yeah. I'm so confused. No, that's. And I was then, gonna say, Barra's teams always get flamed for their draft. Yep. Like that is a yeah. ten year long thing where yeah. Barra's teams draft poorly. And I don't know and why. Get roasted for it on Reddit, uh, yep. and that will now fall at your feet, <laughs> Neil. Because I just yeah. control all of our drafts, unfortunately. So yeah, that's at first, just really inexplicably, unlike. because you've been yeah. terrible at drafting for ten uh-huh. years. But they All keep giving you the keys. Morning. They just keep giving you <laughs> exactly. the keys. Yeah. Also, this kind of goes to what Neil was talking about earlier. Like, um, people were mad at us for picking up Neil. They were like, why did you pick up a coach that got reverse swept? And we're like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, I was, like, I was like, oh, my bad. Like, we were up, like, 20K in a game and we lost. Like, I don't really yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, are you serious? How is that your... Okay. You keep going. Yeah, people, like, can't decide if coaches do nothing or they like are responsible for everything and i was like you gotta pick <laughs> one man yeah yeah who knows uh it's they won't by the way uh pick yeah one. they won't they won't they will continue okay. to pick both um, <laughs> chuckles and there's nothing you can do <laughs> coach canyon tv <laughs> huh? what happened what happened last time we played chuck huh? what happened there buddy 101 the year buddy <laughs> I'm keeping track all year. That has got to be, uh, that had to be the win you wanted the most, Neil, right? To beat Chuck in the head-to-head in the SPL? I would never wish ill will against my <laughs> good friend, and I don't care at all if we beat him, but for the record, we did. Mm. 2-0, by the way. Mm. For the record. I mean, the record. <laughs> for the record. It, so it's not, you know, <laughs> just how it be. Uh, nothing you can do about <laughs> that. All right, last question about coaching uh, before we move on to bonus balance. Neil, you played against young young barry here for years in the league for years so and years young. And years. uh so young. so young just <laughs> so young uh what were once you joined the team environment and started oh, working no. with barra as a teammate <clears throat> were there anything was there anything that you were surprised by that you did not expect after playing against him for so long you figured it might be like this it turned out <laughs> to be like that <laughs> i know what he's gonna say yeah, I was actually, I, I actually was a little bit surprised that he trolled so much at practice. He, he loves it. Every, I think everyone like you, you every now and then you're just gonna wake up and feel a bit goofy. Like you can't just give 100 percent every day. You get burnt out. But, but he gets a bit guy. goofy in practice. But I was, I, I don't really think I was too surprised by too much because I always thought that he was like a good vocal ADC, and that that is the case. Mm-hmm. Um. It was kind of hard. I didn't really have too many perceptions, especially from ADC players, because a lot of them, you just kind of expect them to sit in a corner and like do their thing, and, and some of them do. Uh-huh. But he's, he's a good vocal player, and he has really good comps and team fights. So I, I really, like when I joined this team, I really didn't have any problems to how anyone like was trying to communicate or how anyone played the game. I thought that it was like everyone has like a really good balance on the team, and I think everyone's like has a really easy skill set to work with in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, it's clearly uh, it's clearly been working for the Ravens so far, um, and it's been fun to watch. Okay, let's talk uh, bonus balance real quick as we're already uh, pushing up against our timer. Um, let's talk about uh, crit nerfs first. Um, Deathbringer loses ten power. That means both of its glyphs, uh, but also in Venom, Deathbringer loses the slow on uh, on its passive trigger. Demon Blade loses 5 power, 5% attack speed, and 5% bonus attack speed on the passive. And Bladed Boomerang uh, decreased movement speed on the passive from 4% per stack to 2% per stack. So it used to be 12% max, now it's 6% max. Uh, Barra, how do you think this impacts uh, the ADC build moving forward? Um, Pretty big i want to say i think people are already moving away from boomerang on most gods maybe they'll still build on like izanami mm-hmm. um, but i think people are moving away from it so i think people will be steadily moving away from it now with the um the cowl devos build coming out with the it's like wind demon deathfinger and then you just need more penetration now so uh, people have been moving away from boomerang onto like exe or dom now so you get the double penetration from that um, I think people will try out some pin builds, some yellow damage builds, but probably not Ovo, because Ovo has just felt so bad since Prophetic has came out. Um, also, there's not great like percent pin options to m- make your Ovo do more damage, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I don't think Dom and X are like, great, it's only Titan's Bane, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if people will be going towards Ovo, probably. Probably a mix of Kin's builds with uh, single crit or double crit. 
Probably still a lot of cowls. Um, I think I'm the only person really going the gilded build. Um, but yeah, I I think it was pretty necessary as well because I think crit was a little overstated and also from the kind of noob perspective, noobs hate getting crit. Also, pro players hate getting crit, as I've learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's it's literally a mental thing. I don't know why. <laughs> if I'm dead in that scenario, I'll be like, oh, it's because they crit me. Yep. And, like, I'm always dead in that scenario. And I'm always probably getting off the, the same amount of damage, but I just died. And there was a big, like, number. Yeah. Um, it's, it it's just red. a mental thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, nerfing the stats on all the items probably making all the noobs happy, I would assume. Because um, they were saying that those items are way overstated anyways. Um, the Blood Forge hit was unexpected because I thought people were just going into Devos because Devos has been feel feeling better for a while. Um, so that was kind of surprising, but probably, I guess, for noobs, I guess, maybe. Yeah, Blood Forge uh, lost 10 power from 65 to 55 and decreased the movement speed on the passive trigger from 10% to 7%. Um, yeah, I could say that we didn't have dev notes on these bonus balance notes, but we typically do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that they would mention that Deathbringer uh, is still one of the most popular items in the game uh, and was also very winning. Um, a lot of times, the more popular an item is, the, the less its win percentage is impressive because if it's mm -hmm. in more games, it, that means it's going to lose a lot of games as well as win a lot of games. But yep. um it was definitely still performing well. Uh, and, you know, the, the Reddit thread on the bonus balance notes um, mention the attack speed on Blood Forge being a big problem. You know, I think I can safely say that, you know, we hear that feedback and are, you know, considering what we want to do uh, with Blood Forge in the future. Um, I will say that I think it is... Uh, I find I, I always find it interesting when fans of uh, an item or a god uh, lobby for it to return to a former glory that was not very glorious, you know? Um, yeah, I think Bloodforge is a dead item for years, so. Yeah, this is, th it really has been. Like, it's, it's always been a fun item. Th there's just so much discussion around this, like, it's identity as an item. It's this high power, like curve ender. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just like wasn't ever bought um, in high level play. And that's not to say that every item needs to be bought in high level play or that is, you know, whatever, whatever discussion you want to have, I think is, is valid there. But um, I do think that people forget that this item was not good ever. in that state. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and whether, you know, if that is overall better for the game and for the item individually for it to be in that state, that is a fine conversation to have. Uh, I'm not, I'm not here to, to dismiss that or anything like that. And I think it's um, an important one to have, but I don't know. I just like, it's, it's so uh, there's just a, there's a lot of noise about that one in particular. And I don't know, I guess it just kind of surprises me exactly how honed in um, mm -hmm. they are on that. Yeah. Neil, any, any thoughts on that? I thought this whole patch was, like, really good. I think, like, mm -hmm. at least all the nerfs. I think there's some other things that could be a little bit nerfed, but overall, like, crit is just overwhelming, and I think that a lot of the crit junglers don't feel fair, and there's a lot of junglers that are just, like, randomly played because you can crit and are good, like, throughout the whole game. Like, mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty weird that Baka just kind of, like, was good the whole game now because he just builds all the crit items. He's super mm -hmm. OP early game. His mid game is really strong. His late game is really strong. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of... Um, those crit items were a bit overtuned, like boomerang, especially for junglers, is like really oppressive mm -hmm. on the characters that used it well. So I like those nerfs. I think the Deathbringer, like the Invenom one, is just it had too many things on it. Like the text is just too long. Mm -hmm. I thought it should have that much text. There's too much stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like shredding shields. It was like anti healing. It was like slowing. It's like okay, it probably needs to be tuned down. Mm -hmm. And like you said, still probably really good. The Demon Blade nerf, I'm, that's the one where I'm like, I'm not sure if you need to nerf that one so bad because yeah. the, now crit's like fully dead because mm -hmm. you nerfed all three crit items, maybe you nerfed two of them. Mm -hmm. But I think the Blood Forge nerf makes a lot of sense. I just felt like it was just the same thing. It just had too much on it. Like it had move speed. It has a good pass. It had a lot of power. It had lifesteal. Like it's got a, and it's got attack speed as well. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a dual item. And the, in some cases, you look at Dev's gloves and you're like, 
if you compare them one to one, they weren't even that far off. Only you had to stack one. Right. So I think that's kind of weird that, like, you could buy one outright and then has a similar kind of feel to it as the one you had to stack. Mm -hmm. So I think Blood Forge kind of needed a nerf in that way too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's fair, and I, and it was really good on junglers too because of the move speed now. So I think it's kind of shifted it to more of like a jungler item, mm -hmm. which I think is fine. The ten less power, maybe junglers will favor it less, but. I still feel like it's a tax speed, move speed, power, life steal. It kind of is do all item for junglers still. So yeah, maybe we'll see serrated instead of it a bit more. Sure. But I think that's just healthy. The item was just really powerful, bought by multiple roles all the time. Does a lot of good stuff. It probably should have seen a nerf. So yeah, and I then like Hydra's alongside it, talking about assassins, yeah, same, uh, five percent off the passive. Um, mm -hmm. Hydra's just really, really good. Uh, yeah. For sure. It is. I think it's still going to be really good. I saw some comparisons to Polynomicon. Uh, Poly definitely hits significantly <laughs> harder, but the difference between a two-second ICD and a and zero ICD is enormous. Kind of uh, large, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's even a, just the numbers on it, like right. it gives you pen and cooldown. Like Poly doesn't do that. Yep, that's true. It does neither of those things. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you know, obviously, some pretty big damage hits across the board because we aren't done there. Do more loses 15 power. Spear of Desolation loses 10 power. Tahuti loses 10 power and 5% damage increase off the passive. And Spear of the Magus, uh, passive debuff goes from 9% to 5%. So mage damage uh, coming down pretty uh, pretty drastically if they're building all of these items, which some a lot of characters were. Uh, I've seen a lot of discussion on the Magus change, feeling like 9% to 5% is a little intense. Um... I do, you know, obviously it see it it has a lot of like whoa, it's almost cut in half like when you read it off the page. I would say that if you looked at an item if you looked at that item as it reads now for the very first time, you've never seen Spear of the Magus before, you read this passive, you're like, "Oh, that it that's got to be really good." Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I right. still think that gods who use Magus well, uh Anubis, Merlin, you know, those types of gods they are still going to buy Magus and feel like this is a really good power spike for me and for my team because it isn't just remember you deal more damage it's they take more damage from all sources um so I don't know I, I feel like Magus is still going to be pretty viable uh and pretty and pretty good in the mid lane any uh do you guys feel differently at all around Magus uh I feel like mages needed a nerf um mm -hmm. also the Magus nerf I feel like you're still just going to build the item when you were building it before. Yep. Because uh, I still feel like that item's pretty good. Yeah, I agree. Neil? I feel that way for all the items. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think that the items were all just overtuned. Like, I look at all the item nerfs, so, like, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, do more mm -hmm. 15 power. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. They give it pen just randomly, and it gives you rotational power at MP5. Like, you're, like, a walking fountain MP5-wise. Like, take some power off, sure. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Deso, like, way too cheap, way too much power. That makes sense. The rod, rod, same thing as Doomor, just does everything. It's just really broken. Magus, I, I might have just like, I, I don't think it's like a bad item or anything, but maybe it would be interesting to see, like you take, you leave the passive the way it was and take some pen off of like the actual item itself. Maybe, mm. maybe that feels better as like an option for, say like a like a support who wants to build it or something instead maybe there's more viability for that mm. for like a luxury on for a support well maybe. it needs to be it needs to have pen in order to be in that tree uh yeah but just maybe maybe take four pen off of like the actual thing and leave the passive as it was at nine percent maybe an idea yeah i don't think we have any tier three sure. items that are below it's usual like yeah. tier threes are either eight percent or sixteen percent mm -hmm. you know formerly yeah ten or twenty um it's not to say that we can't do something mm -hmm. like that um but it would we would have to have pretty good reason and feel like that yeah. is by far the best change in order to break convention mm -hmm. in that way i think mm -hmm. I, I could see the item getting picked up less and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing sure like maybe people will just build like a mirrodin in place of that or maybe they'll just go like a soul reaver a bit earlier maybe at Magus like last or something mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised to see it fall down a little bit on the tier list but mm -hmm. I still think it's fine, like you guys were saying as well. I think it's still, like, a good item. Mm -hmm. But it does feel bad, and I feel like that's going to spark a lot of change in people's builds, and just, like, ah, it feels bad now. It's not as good. It's a mental thing, yeah. Yeah, yes. maybe. Yeah, I mean, it should be worse. It's usually a good sign uh, when you can nerf something, and it's still, it still is good. 
it's just For less sure. good. Yeah. That is usually a sign that it was a, a, a solid nerf candidate and mm-hmm. sometimes it is intent for things to be nerfed out of the meta um sometimes it isn't and uh it is up to you the players to decide what we were trying to do um so you're gonna buff the bow tree or what that's up to that's up to us in the future i suppose kind of does need to be buffed honestly aphrodite uh gets, <laughs> gets nerfed uh, her protections go uh, that she's sharing go from 15 to 10 percent and the jealousy damage buff uh, was eight to twenty percent. Is now five to fifteen percent. And then Martikaros loses some movement speed on the three and some prot shred on the alt. Uh, thoughts did on we Neil? Just scratch our heads at the exact same time. Yeah, you kind of did, huh? Some good synergy. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what he's been coaching. It's just like perfect. <laughs> like okay, and then you take your right hand and it's two strokes, you know, two little rubs of the chin. Like half of what I do is like when you're done game, everyone like count to three, take your headset off, yep. two breaths, stand up at the same time. Yep, exactly. <laughs> that would be intimidating if you saw the enemy team do the headset take off, stand up, oh. and then like. You rub their hands or, like, you know, grab rub something in the same way. Rub their bellies, I just guess. Like these that guys be, are robots, man. That would be, like, I'd be like, oh, my on? God, what is going on over there? They're, it's just their day, you know? You They're don't know. They're a well machine. It. They can't be stopped. Yeah. Okay, well, now you know what you're working on in practice this week. Um, <laughs> yeah, thoughts on Aphrodite or Martikaros here, Neil? Do you feel like they are, uh, at a competitive level, um, significantly worse, mildly worse, dead, the same? Um, it's hard to say for the Afro one, because she literally just got changed, like, not too long ago, from 20 to 15. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this double nerf might kind of put her more to the ground. Mm-hmm. Like, I felt really strong about this character for a while, that she was, like, really not balanced, and there was, like, a lot of different ways you could play her. And, like, just the fact that her sustain feels, like, really significant in the early mid-game now, just based on, like, how they did the global healing changes and whatnot, and everything's based now, it felt, like, pretty significant. Mm-hmm. She felt really good. Now it kind of feels like her numbers, like over the last month, have been halved pretty well. I think the jealousy debuff, like damage buff reduction, is like really good because that was overtuned. The prots, I'm not so sure if like 20 to 15 was already enough and now it's another five off. I'm not sure if that's going to kill the character or not. Mm -hmm. I I might have maybe liked to see one nerf at a time, but honestly, I, I feel like that character was just really, really broken, like, those two changes they made where she shares prots and jealousy damages was really overtuned. So I'm glad to see the nerf. Not sure if she'll be played as much anymore, hard to say, but the Marty nerf, I think they're both really good. I don't think... They're kind of like the nerf where they kind of slap you on the wrist a bit. It's just, like, a really powerful character. Let's give him a few nerfs that aren't going to, like, obviously aren't going to kill him, but they're going to make him inherently worse. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he's still kind of the same character, but just... His numbers have barely been touched down. I really don't think those nerfs on Marty are going to do anything to the character. Still be still be top pick, top ban potential. Uh, Potentially, yeah. I think that yep. teams aren't really sure still how they want to value him, but right. But I think he's still going to be picked for sure, banned for sure. His his pick ban was super high, like ninety four percent, I think, last week, if I remember correctly, at the top of my head. But his win rate was very low. Um, mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll see. Barry, your your thoughts on these two? Uh, Afro is a character where I really don't know how I feel about her because on release she was absolutely cracked, and then I feel like in every rank game she's been banned, and I haven't had much experience against her, and I just don't really know how I feel about the character as mm-hmm. a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, whether she's like still OP, whether both the nerfs like make her dead, um, whether she's playable, and then so Afro like I I think most teams are kind of up in the air about the meta in general right now um, mm-hmm. with like what characters are good, what characters are bad, like what to pick where in your draft. I think this is the most like up in the air the meta's been in a long time, mm-hmm. um, and then also the Marty ban or the Marty uh, change doesn't really do too much in my opinion mm. fair enough we'll still see some Marty. i mean he there. definitely yeah, needed a nerf but it's uh i don't i think as neil said i think it's more of a slap on the wrist nerf which in my opinion it's a bonus patch so it's, it's fine like i don't think he needs to like die in a bonus patch mm-hmm. sure yeah absolutely uh, i think that makes sense um all right that uh that does it for our normal um episode let's uh 
Let's go on to our random question of the week, of course, which is found in our Patreon uh, community Discord. You can head on over to patreon.com slash backliners in order to uh, join up and get exclusive Hamlet pictures. Uh, oh my gosh. What else mm-hmm. could be a better motivator than that? Barra's new puppy that is absolutely disgustingly cute <laughs> Inclusive pictures in the community discord patreon.com slash backliners is the place to go for that um all right hero's uh, question is up first um how do you guys feel about aurora and pbm's new podcast and why it should absolutely be called the frontliners courtesy of cyclone spins idea uh well, that's a great idea it's a slightly sarcastic uh, latter part and doesn't need to be answered uh, but that is what people oh. want <laughs> to uh want it to be called um, if you guys haven't checked it out, Aurora and Mike do have a new podcast uh, that is untitled as of now, as far as I know. Um, but it's been awesome. I've watched both episodes. A little bit longer form, um, less about current Smite stuff and more about like thinking back and talking about old stories and all that kind of stuff, which is just awesome, awesome content from two dudes who I would listen to talk about just about anything. Um, you can check out, I think it's on Mike's YouTube channel and they stream it on Aurora's Twitch channel. Uh, I don't know which day of the week they typically do it, but... You know, maybe go follow Wednesdays. them on Twitter. Yeah, Wednesdays maybe. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's really, really good stuff. Um, so highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I think the Frontliners is is funny, um, but I they would. I'm sure it occurred to them, and they clearly uh, aren't going with it. Um, mm-hmm. Which you know, it really should though. It's kind of offensive because like, yeah, is our name just bad? It might be. Should we do a whole rebrand right now? Should, should we? Oh my God. Wait, what if we untitled our podcast? We just said it's aggro and Barra's untitled podcast until that's they, until idea. they come up with a name and then we and come then up we with a name theirs. that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of like theirs. Yeah. Genius. I like it. Okay. What if they don't come up with a name? We're both just untitled forever. Then those then would be you two copied them. very worthy <laughs> you copied them. podcast titles. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, last episode they had Kabam on, and Kabam is uh, is an absolute beast. I that guy. It was a gr- what the heck? It was a great episode. Uh, highly recommend. Um, Dreamy Martini wants to know what is one of your biggest pet peeves in life. Theirs, for example, is when you're driving and a lane is ending, and people see the need to merge, oh. but wait and try and get to get in front of everybody else. <laughs> That's a great pet peeve to to think of for sure. Bear? Uh, I would say most traffic interactions are tilting yes um just people especially i feel like everyone says this but especially in georgia they do not know how to drive what nowhere is like we actually have good drivers here yeah Yeah. especially awful it's bad because there are so many people here that's why it feels really bad here. It's and we're not all that... jam packed into like two lanes. Yes, it is not like you know, of course, I'm in like New York City or something like that. But the mm-hmm. sheer amount of volume of people for how big of an area it is is absolutely absurd. Um, and there is just constant people everywhere, uh, and it is no fun driving a lot of so those areas. One of my pet peeves is the rising prices of peanut butter. Mm, my okay. peanut butter has gone up at sixty cents in the oh. last year. Wow. It was like a dollar sixty, and it's now two dollars and twenty nine cents. That mm-hmm. is absurd. Yeah, yeah. Don't For get me started on ounces of peanut butter, Barry. It's not a good idea to get me started on capitalism on a pet peeve question. You know, like don't. Sorry, that's not that's an unwise call uh, from you. Wait, is making your own peanut butter cheaper? Uh, I don't know. Someone in chat did not suggest for your that. time. Surely that's not value for your time. Surely. Yeah, that has yeah. got to be way more effort than it's worth. Unless it's really good. And you do has, love peanut butter. That's a lot of peanuts. I feel like I'm not getting 16 ounces of peanuts for less than $2. I feel like you could almost certainly get like a Costco-sized box of peanuts. for You could get them for dirt cheap, yeah. For peanuts on the dollar, you know what I mean? You guys okay. have peanuts in your <laughs> Costco. Surely you could get... Well, like, yeah, I mean, I assume you could get something like peanuts at a wholesaler like that. I've seen almonds and walnuts at Costco. I've not seen peanuts yet. Well, surely well, someone sorry. at Costco can hook it up with an absolutely. Uh, do you think that like someone's job at Costco is they're like, okay, we're gonna start offering this new product. How big should our container of it be? And like three True. people are like pouring it into a con- like a, a a massive container to like determine the overall size. 
And there's someone who stands there and just, and there it's like, tell me when to stop for how big the size is going to be. And they just stand there and they stand there. Well, it's like, all and they're her. like, the, you know, the people pouring it are like, are you sure? Like, this is so much. And they're like, more. more. And you, they, they just wait and they just fit. They just fill everything up and they're like, enough. And it's the size of the room. Like everything you get at Costco like, how could they possibly have determined that this is the correct amount of stuff to give you on a, on a wholesale price? Like, it's insane. Uh, <laughs> there, It's too much. It's not good. Don't make me, like, I, it stresses me out to go in there because it's so, like, I'm committing to having a million, it's like a million servings of whatever food I'm buying anytime mm-hmm. I buy anything there. Their hummus is outrageously good. And yeah, cheap. do you get it in the gallon well, or the or the double gallon? I was gonna gallon? say, like, you surely you have too much hummus drink. I'm never gonna eat all this before it goes bad, it's, though. Surely. No, their hummus lasts forever. It lasts for like two months. Is that That's a real crazy. thing? Yeah, I don't know what they put in it, but it's delicious. Yeah, it's in a half gallon bucket. You it's like it... 32 ounces of hummus. Like that container is large. But is it, it like is... one of the ones where you're gonna like get your hands dirty when you're getting to the bottom? You have to like get in there or like? No, it's it's wide. It's like. Oh, okay. Big. That's. Yeah, yeah, it's a juicer container. Yeah. If someone if someone from Costco management is listening to this and they're like, oh, half gallon bucket of hummus. That's a great idea. It's <laughs> going to be there starting uh, next week. Neil, how about for you? What's one of your uh, biggest pet peeves in life? Well, one instantly I was thinking about when, we, when that person brought up traffic was, especially it happened a lot in Georgia, is when people are merging on the highway and when they're merging, they're not going the speed limit of the highway. Yeah. Like, do you want all of us to die? Yeah. Like, it's so dangerous. <laughs> yes. Like, I, like, when I was in Georgia, the speed limit, the, whatever the speed limit is, people were going, like, 20 under. And I'm like, we are going so slow and cars are whizzing by us. Like, this yeah. is terrible. Like, what is this? Yes. And then other than that, down here are dangerous. it's awful. Oh, and no one signals. People pass each other on the shoulder. I'm like, what is happening? Yep. <laughs> but any, another one uh, is people who are, like, always late for stuff by, like, an unreasonable amount. Mm. Like, it's just really inconsiderate of someone else's time. Like, if you have, like, a valid excuse something bad happened, like, fair game, or you're, like, 10 minutes late, you got a contract, like, it happens, but someone's, like, 30 minutes late, it's, like, I've just been sitting here, or, like, two people or three people have been sitting here waiting for you for, like, so long. Yeah. It's just lame, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for including the unreasonable amount of time, because yeah. uh, well, I am someone who is habitually two minutes late to everything yep. I do. And that's fine, and that's fine. You can count on me being two minutes late, though. Like, and here's my personal so someone's rule. like, our, our, like, dinner is at 7.58, Ryan. Yeah, no. <laughs> Ryan's like, you're like, That sure, doesn't work. Sure. I know it's at 8, and I'll show up at 8.02. <laughs> um, first of all, my ex- here are my excuses. Both of my parents are the two most habitually late people I've ever met in my entire life, and they are both 45 minutes late to everything. They are both terrible about that, and it drives me crazy. And the fact that I'm only two minutes late is actually mm-hmm. a miracle. And secondly, my personal rule as someone who is always late is that I will not give you a heads up if I'm going to be less than five minutes late. And if I'm going to be more than five minutes late, I always like send a text like, hey, I'm running a little late. I'll, be, sure. there. Um, I'll be there around this time. That's Which my, is great. That's my rule of thumb. And I stick sure. to it very, very steadfast. Like, That's a good point. It's like when you let someone know if you're going to be late in advance, dude, it's nice. Whereas if you show up half an hour late, it's like, well, like what the hell? Like, what yeah. am I, I've been, I could have been doing something else with my time or like, not like waiting for you, like, like actively for like 15 minutes. I could have just done anything else, you know? Yep. But then I keep you waiting and like on the edge of your seat and you're like, dude, like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. What are some Matt, of my big pet peeves? Oh, Barry, sorry. You were going to say something? Yeah. Neil reminded me of one. Uh, Uber drivers that can't drive. Oh, yeah. Uh, when you're riding in the backseat and you're like, am I about to die yes, right now <laughs> there's so, so many of them for some reason and like it's so scary yeah that is, that is really scary uh uber drivers who um insist on talking the whole time also do it oh. and i don't I, I promise it is not like uh i'm you know too good to talk to this person type of thing or something like that sometimes i'm in the mood to like chit chat and chat it up and that kind of stuff and admittedly most of the time um i am not uh, mm-hmm. if, if you podcast listeners can believe it, um, mm-hmm. this is absolutely the majority of talking I do in my like day, if not week, um, is, is this podcast. I am someone who does not enjoy, uh, a whole lot of like small talk, uh, 
with strangers. Um, what like what we got in an Uber on the way home from visiting family from the airport, and that's a good hour plus drive. And this absolute saint of an Uber driver picked us up, put our luggage in the trunk, got in the car, didn't say a word the entire time up from the airport to our house, dropped us off, took the luggage out of the out of the trunk, said, "Have a nice day." <laughs> Greatest moment of my life up until right now when Barra's dog just showed up on the podcast again. Look at this little man. Oh. He's actually so adorable. He's the cutest dog in the entire world. Uh, Patreon.com slash backliners to get ex- exclusive pictures. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm just absolutely abusing him. He's um, so cute, man. Yeah, so I, I will say that uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is definitely people who... Um, try to keep a conversation like a small talk conversation going when I think that it is pretty clear, like I'm not being rude, but I'm also Mm -hmm. very clearly not in the mood to talk. Uh, Mm -hmm. People who don't pick up on those hints. um, Yeah. Is a little bit of a pet peeve for me. Like you said, especially when you're back from the airport, like uh, back from like my flight from Arlington after worlds. Yep. And it was like 10 o'clock. And, like, just got out of the flame. This guy's taught me the whole time. I'm like, dude, like, after a flight, it's like, come on. Brain fried. Can't do it. Um, yeah, I'm so tired. Yep, does just doesn't work. Hiru uh, asked as well, what is one co-op game that you both haven't gotten a chance to play or seldomly played um, and would love to try out with one another? Barry, you any co-op games you want to... Dude, I, know, I got one. That's here. I we've talked. One. We've talked about this on the podcast. We have got to have a night where we get together and play some Castle Crashers. Oh, yes. I've play a game forever. Let me see. I, I, I have it downloaded. So I downloaded it recently. Uh, I was trying to get people in the Discord I hang out in to, to play, and I downloaded it, and I don't think anybody else did. Cause they all... I played this on <laughs> Xbox 360, I Yes. Think. Yeah, it, yes, was. Sir. it was. It was a great party game on Xbox 360. Neil, yeah. are you hopping in on the Castle Crashers? I've been down to give it a run. I never really played oh, it, good. so like, oh. let's, let's, get it, let's get it going, you know? One of the greatest co-op games of all time um yeah i've been looking for new ones I, I it's hard to find a good like co-op game i feel like or maybe it's just hard maybe i'm just looking in the wrong place mm. no it is really hard no it's hard for sure because i played it takes two and that game was like insanely good oh, I saw the and then you're like it's it's it literally it didn't win game of the year like it actually was so good and mm-hmm. i was playing it and i was just like why are there a lot more games like this and like how do i yeah. find ones that are like this have you played um unraveled and unraveled 2 no oh, i haven't unraveled but i want to play so one good. i uh, think they're downstairs joe joe and i played that game together and my wife is mm-hmm. not a gamer um but she really liked it because i could she could just hop on my little yarn back and like hmm. i could do the platforming for us and all that yeah. kind of stuff and mm-hmm. just a little nice little co-op puzzle game great game highly recommend mm-hmm. uh, unraveled 2 that is uh, that is a good one. Um, yeah, my sorry. Go ahead. Only game I would say is, would be like Overcooked Two. Yeah, Overcooked is good. I I just love those kind of like really difficult teamwork style games. Yeah, um, I'm just a big fan of those. Yeah, Overcooked is really good. One time we were playing Overcooked. It was me, Joe, uh, Nick Keo, aka Pretty Hair, uh, who used to be a Paladins caster, and uh, his wife, and we were playing. And we had been doing a little, it was on the weekend and we'd been doing a little drinking, um, playing a little drinking game while playing it. And <laughs> it was one, of, I don't think I've ever like broken down in the middle of a game faster than I was, his wife's name is, uh, Mackenzie. And I was like, Mackenzie, I need a plate. And she did complete, she was so stressed out and just like trying to keep up. She goes, yes, chef. And then keeps, <laughs> and I just instantly oh. died. Like it was just the fun. I still say yes, chef, in that exact tone to this day because it was so, that was so good. Just role playing hard, you know. Um, all right. Finally, Neon Kerm asked if you get a remake of any video game, what video game would you choose? A remake um, of any video game. Okay, this might take me a while to answer. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck <laughs> uh, i don't know a lot of like my childhood games actually got like remade like i liked diablo 2 a lot and that got remade i liked yeah. wow a lot when i was growing up that got remade i played a lot of counter strike when i was growing up and that's just like gets revamped all the time mm-hmm. 
Hmm. Wait, remade like same universe, same style of game, but better? Or, yeah, like, just like re-graphic? updated for the modern day. Like uh, Resident Evil 4 remake is a great example yeah, right. of mm. that's one of my favorite games of all time on GameCube. And then it, the remake came out. It looks gorgeous. They did a lot of quality of life improvements, added some nice little new features, but didn't change the game a whole lot. I didn't actually play it because I beat the game like 10 plus times uh, on GameCube. And instead, I just watched a lot of people play it for the first time and had an absolute blast. Like, loved watching people play it who hadn't played it. It was some of the best watching of any video game I've ever uh, had. And if you haven't played Resident Evil 4, highly recommend playing the remake. It's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal game. Um, I would say, I mean, obviously, if Smite is a choice, um, I would go Dungeon Defenders... I have like four, I think. I would go mm-hmm. Dungeon Defenders, Diablo 2, um, Warcraft 3. That's their whole remake. And... <laughs> no, 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 I mean like good remakes. Oh, I don't mean okay, like okay. Blizzard, like money grabbing. <laughs> I mean like an actual quality, like okay, okay. new campaign, my bad, new my heroes. Bad. Yeah, I can't my believe fault. you say that. My fault, me. my fault. Um, there was one more. Uh, I would like a Halo 2 remake, um, but I don't know if it would ever actually, like, give me the same nostalgia feeling that I had, like, playing it initially. Because I did go back and play, and I was like, man, this game is not good. Um, it would not, unfortunately. Yeah. Dude, I saw a TikTok on my Twitter feed that really, like, got me in my feelings. It was of, like, a dad uh, who who seemed pretty young, like, filming his kid play Fortnite and just, like, talking to his friends and, like, playing and he's like, and the caption was, he's in those good years right now. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. he's experiencing the, his good years of gaming. And I was like, man, that hit me, you know? Like, because those are just, you just have a time where there's just the right game that you love and your friends mm-hmm. love and you play together. And it's just like this intensity of, like, fun that is unlike anything you will experience again. Uh, mm mm-hmm. And not to say it's like the most fun you'll ever have, but it's a type of fun that you can never get back after you get older. Yeah, you um, can't you can't bottle it. Yeah, you can't replicate it. Uh, yeah. And I was like, damn, that is that 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 is awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyways, Neil, go ahead on your uh, remake desires. I'm I'm not sure because like I was saying like Diablo two was like a huge one for me, and I played like the re- the remade one. And it was done pretty well, but I was like, dude, like it's just not the same as when you're young like you're saying nope. like when you're in that golden age you're playing that game it came out for the time it's just like insane yep i don't know i don't i honestly don't know because a lot of the games i do want to experience like that were just remade mm-hmm. like i well, do think one of the ones might be warcraft 3 because i never even bought it because it was supposed to be just terrible yeah. maybe i don't know day of defeat was kind of cool i don't, I don't know, know. maybe maybe one of the fable games oh sure. wolfenstein Oh, um, it's like Wolfenstein Enemy Territory was pretty good back in the day. I see. I didn't play a lot of variety. Like when I when I grew, I played. I shouldn't say that, but a lot of it was just I played like these games I really didn't enjoy, and then they just ended up remaking them. Like I said, like Counter Strike and stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hard to say. Day of Defeat you? was uh, looks exactly like I never played it, never seen it before. It looks exactly like Medal of Honor Rising Sun that I played. Yeah, it's got that vibe too um, for sure. What a great game that was. Like, uh yeah, some of my favorite games of all time, you know, Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops 2, I do not want those yeah. remade. Because I know if 31-year-old <laughs> me played those games, it would tarnish how I feel about them. I know that they were not balanced uh, and were not would not be fun in the today's environment. Too, man. I yep. was... Uh, I did get such joy out of spawn tubing people um, mm-hmm. in search over and over and over again. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't really want those to be remade. Um, an easy one that comes to mind instantly is Mario Superstar Baseball for the GameCube. Um, Ooh, that was a good one. Don't make a new Mario Baseball. Uh, it won't be as good. Just update Mario Superstar Baseball to just port it, actually. All you got to do. You don't even have to remake it. Just port it uh, wow. as is. Okay. Um, it's perfect. Uh, let's see. What else? Oh, I had another one that I was thinking of. Um Oh, I thought of it. Did either of you uh, see? Neither of you guys mentioned any GameCube games. I don't know if you're a big GameCube game. I, I literally just thought of I three. Games. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. I've got two from the GameCube. Number one, Custom Robo was one of the best, the coolest games I've ever played. Really obscure, big fan. Uh, 
that would be a sick game to remake and I think could actually work well as like a free to play model in today's mm. uh, game environment. And Beautiful Joe was an awesome oh. game that came it's into awesome my right. mind like weeks ago for some reason and I have been unable to get it out of my brain. Uh, I want to play mm. Beautiful Joe again so badly. That would be a great game to remake. So that, those, are, those thing- are my two. I know about that game is I've watched Marvel versus Capcom and he can mm-hmm. like infinite someone in a corner yeah, and hit them for like the smallest amount. So that's the only thing I know about that little guy. Dude, Beautiful Joe was awesome. It was such a yeah. sick concept. Like that game was a real, that was an art. Like that, that mm-hmm. game was, was a work of <clears throat> art. Not that it was like literally perfect, but just conceptually and the, the theming and like how they executed, like just so cool. Um, hmm. And huge fan, huge, huge, huge fan of Beautiful Joe. What a great game okay. that was. I thought of three games, maybe four, I don't know, maybe four or something like that. Mm-hmm. Golden Sun yep. for the Game Boy Advance. That game was insane. I love that game so much. It was so much fun. Yep. That'd be good to game to remake. Um, NHL Hits and the, and Red yes. Card for the game. Yes, team. Both those games are like the same thing. They're so funny. They were so much fun just to play. The remake would be so good. Yeah. A re- NHL hits, MLB Slugfest, and NFL Blitz. Yeah. If they could remake those, they'll never be able to ever again because th- those leagues won't give them licenses anymore. Yeah, for sure. But it's a crime. Those are those and, games were so good. And the last one was Morrowind, like the early Elder mm. Scrolls game. That game was Ooh. so good. Are you the new uh, Bethesda? Like, I don't know if it's official. Is it an Elder Scrolls game? I know like that they released some footage for, for it or something not not some direct footage but there was some gameplay footage just like a title and a whatever what is it called like star or something not sure. uh, let's see if i can pull it up here uh yeah i don't know starfield yeah releasing in september 2023 is it officially elder scrolls 6 i don't know if that's like okay no chuck is saying it's its own thing yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I'm in, I, I'm gonna try and play that on release because I have ne- I've never played an Elder Scrolls game. Really? Except They're for so good. within the last like like two years ago, I went and tried to play Skyrim for the first time in my life, and I don't mean to burst everybody's like Skyrim <laughs> oh, bubble, no. but trying to play Skyrim. If you haven't played Skyrim before and you try to play it in the year 2021, you will not have fun. You, it is unplayable. And that's fine. It's not its fault. It's a different era. You know, there were oh, different... wrong with it? It was unplayable. What do you mean? You It felt terrible. It was just un... You couldn't do it. Like, I, and everyone says, it needs mods to feel good. I, mo- I had someone install mods to make it feel good. It did not feel good. Because I'm coming at it from a fresh perspective. It wasn't good enough. Uh, and that's fine. It's old. Like, it's not its fault. You keep saying it's fine, so it I don't is. attack you. <laughs> it doesn't really sound But I feel the fine. need... I don't know, I haven't played in a long time. Maybe you're right. But you're probably not Well, right. I am. But maybe am. you're right. It, but, it, you, but if you loved it before, you won't see the these things as flaws. It's just like, it's part of the nostalgia of it for you. Yeah. For someone who doesn't have any nostalgia, it isn't playable anymore. Um, so I'm interested to see what that's, that studio is going to put mm-hmm. out with, uh, with Starfield. Um and it should be interesting. Okay, we're way over time, but that's kind of how it be sometimes. Even though they don't think it be like it is, it do, as they say. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Neil, thanks for coming on. Um, we'll be back next week with more great podcast action. Check out other predictions of other shows. Uh, shout out to Factor. Factor.com slash Backliners40. Or Factormeals.com, excuse me. Factormeals.com slash Backliners40 to get 40% off your first box. Check out predictions of other shows. <laughs> I think I already said that. Until then, uh, Barra, you know what to do. Bye. Clean. I was a little late on the transition, though. I kind of, I was so wrapped up in the buy that it I took found me a your bit casting there. moment. Oh yeah, yeah. we got to do that immediately. We're out of here. See ya. <laughs>